Uh, be praying for those affected by the storm on Monday. Just kind of an update too. Dottie Bartlett had a, a, a hip surgery today and uh, she is out in, in recovery. So we praise God for that. Uh, also, there's a few other prayer requests that uh, are floating around through the church body. Some are on the list and some aren't. So remember to keep each other in prayer. If you're joining us as a uh, as a, a guest, maybe you're just tuning in, checking out HBF. We're glad that you're joining us tonight. This is Heartland Baptist Fellowship. We're a church in the heart of America with a heart for people. We're located in uh, Cass County, Missouri. We're just south of Kansas City, just right off of I-49. Uh, and if you're nearby here and you're wanting to check us out sometime, we're down by Coke Stiggy Vet Clinic, just down around the corner on the outer road on the west side of uh, 49, just down from the interchange at 7 Highway and 49. So... Uh, we'd love to have you by sometime, and that's uh, kind of an invitation for this Sunday. This Sunday, uh, the 10th, Mother's Day, we're going to open up and uh, go back to safe distance worship. So uh, you're welcome to join us at 9:30 a.m. or t- uh, or or not. I'm sorry, 9 a.m. or 10:30 a.m. So we're excited about the opportunity to start meeting back together in our first step. Of course, we'll have social distancing, and there's a lot of parameters that are not our normal, and they won't be they won't be our normal forever. But for at least a month of May, uh, we'll have some uh, processes that we'll have to go through to meet. But we're happy to do that to uh, meet all the needs and requirements of all the folks, uh, both that uh, have concerns about COVID, but also the powers that be that are trying to uh, stem the flow of this virus. So we're glad to have you with us tonight. If you have your Bibles, we'll be in the the book of Ephesians chapter 1. And uh, uh, if you need an outline... Uh, You can go to, if you linked through hbfcast.org to this live feed. Um, Ray, is there anybody on the live feed? Nobody's even on right now, so I'm talking to the atmosphere. So uh, if you're coming on late, you can go to the listen uh, and go to the Book of Ephesians uh, study uh, on Wednesday night, and they will uh, connect you and direct you and uh, get you... um, uh, you can find the, the handout. You just, it's on the, tonight on the live feed. If you hit click here uh, in the notes, it'll take you to tonight's handout for tonight's study of Ephesians chapter 1 as we work through the book of Ephesians chapter 1. So um, I'm going to go ahead um, and uh, as hopefully a few folks will come online. And you did send out the invite, Ray? Okay, so folks will know about it. All right, so we're going to go ahead then and and jump into the book of Ephesians chapter 1. I just want to start by review, uh, just kind of cover some of the things that we've already covered. Uh, The title of our theme, uh, really I should say for this study, is Building the Body of Christ in the Image and Likeness of Christ. It's really, Ephesians is a great book. Ephesus was a city kind of like in a world that we're in today. There's a lot of opposition to Christ. There was a lot of of uh, a lot of tension. Of course, you know, goddess, the, uh, the goddess of Ephesus was Diana. And, uh, of course, Paul's preaching of the gospel was in direct conflict with that, affected the trade unions there. And, and so there was political upheaval around the gospel. There was all kinds of things going on. And yet it seemed to be a church that prevailed. They, they, uh, they were really prolific in ministry, and, uh, and they had a, a good understanding wisdom on how to uh, discern uh, false teachers, and, and the Lord Jesus Christ even commended them for that. So we talked about all that in the history, but just uh, you know, in regard to, to what we're wanting to accomplish as we get through this study, we want to reveal, um, we want to see the true identity of Christ. And in that, we can really see the outline of the book of, of Ephesians. In Ephesians 1 and 2, we see Christ's deity. In Ephesians 3 and 4, we see Christ, the church's unity, I should say. And in, in uh, Ephesians 5 and 6, we see uh, Christian's duty. And then uh, as we break down the chapters of, of Ephesus, uh, or Ephesians, I should say, in chapter 1, which is where we are right now, we've already covered the introduction, Paul's introductions in verses 1 and 2, and we're in the midst of studying the blessings uh, that, are, that are given to us through Christ, so uh, Christ's blessings to us. So we have Paul's introduction to us, and then we have Christ's blessings to us, and then we have uh, Paul's prayers for us. And so we're working through these blessings, so uh, that's going to be good tonight. As we're going to talk about the big word predestination. And so uh, I would say, too, I've actually changed something on the outline. So if you were following along last week, uh, I believe it's number four. Um, I realized I had the wrong word in there. So I want to correct that before I get started. We were talking about Christ's blessings to us. Uh, and the first thing that we see is that he has chosen us. The second thing is predestinated us. We're going to look at that tonight. The third thing is he's accepted us in the beloved. The, the fourth thing 
is that he, uh, he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Uh, the thing that's changed, by the way, is number four. I think I had forgiven us. That's redeemed us. If you look in the text in verse 7, it's redeemed. Uh, and then number six, he has made known unto us the mystery of his will. And number seven, he has sealed us with the Holy Spirit of promise and provided for us the earnest of our inheritance, which, which we'll be talking about that. We spent a lot of time last week talking about the word all and uh, how in, encapsulating that is. What an incredible promise we have uh, with that word right in the introduction of Ephesians as, as we're promised all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And so uh, that's really what this is about is we are really focusing on our inheritance and we're getting to see what God's got for us. And so it's something that we want to understand. The spiritual blessings are, are what we're talking about, not physical blessings. We also have physical blessings that we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Those are predestined to us. We're going to look at that here in just a few minutes. But we talked about the word all and how important it is in the book of Ephesians. It references our blessings. It also re references uh, the very nature of God. And in Ephesians 4, 6, as it speaks of one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. And, um, and it also reminds us of the duty of a Christian in the sixth chapter to stand, having done all to stand, stand therefore. So it goes from really the theological to the real practical, the need to stand for Christ. And then we also talked about uh, how these blessings are spiritual, not physical. And uh, I won't rehearse everything that we talked about, but one of the things that we got into last week was this foreknowledge and, and the understanding what that is talking about in verse uh, uh, 4 of chapter 1 in regard to um, you know, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, you know, and understanding that God has foreknowledge of what our inheritance would be in Christ. He's always chosen to have our inheritance found in Christ. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. And uh, we should not confuse that <clears throat> with his capacity, uh, with the capacity of his son to save the world. And there is some false teachings, which we covered last week. I'll touch on them a little bit more uh, in regard to Calvinism that are wrapped around that. But Paul, uh, Paul said it, uh, you know, uh, he, he was, he was uh, very clear in 2 Timothy 1.9 uh, that, uh, you know, the grace that was given to us in Christ Jesus was given before the world began. Before there was me or there was you, uh, the grace that God intended to give to man was through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so we talked about um, uh, Ep Epictetus uh, and Plato and the philosophy of Zeus uh, back in the Greek philosophies that had this concept of a deity that uh, foreordained and really uh, not foreknew, but foreordained your salvation selectively uh, would uh, in their sovereignty, uh, you know, deem who was worthy of uh, life and not all of that. Well, that crept into um, Augustus, uh, the, the, his soteriology, uh, the Catholic scholar. And then, of course, later during the Reformation, a lot of that work got lifted by a guy named John Calvin. And John Calvin now, a lot of his thesis, which is the same as Augustus, which really goes back to the, that Greek philosophy that we're, I was just mentioning, really boils down to a, a five-point outline called TULIP. And I'm not going to get into that right now, but one of the things that I am going to talk about here in just a moment is one of the elements that is wrapped around this concept of TULIP. Uh, and this is not a study of TULIP. This is a study of the Bible. So the, the nice thing is, when addressing these things, some of you right now don't even have a clue when I say tulip, but you don't know what I'm talking about, and that's awesome. Um, I, well, I grew up just learning the Bible, so I didn't have to get my mind messed up with a bunch of other philosophies. And so when this stuff came across my plate as a young man in the ministry, I just went right back to the Bible, and whoa and behold, the Bible has the answers. And uh, it's amazing how if you just believe the Bible and you study it, it sets, it sets forth clearly what God intends for salvation, and, uh, and it, it also clears up the fog of philosophies that the devil has tried to uh, work into the gospel over these years. So uh, that's kind of a review of where we've been. And uh, so tonight I want to pick it up on the second thing that God has given to us. So at the top of the, of the note sheet, if you've got a note sheet, the second one that is that he predestinated, that's the blank, uh, even tonight under point two, if, you're on, if you've gone down the page to point two, he's predestinated us under the adoption of children by Christ to himself. And so um, if you uh, have a Bible, let's just read through the text tonight, Ephesians chapter one. And uh, I'm not going to tarry too long. I may not get past predestination in the time we have. So I'm going to try to get this in and, and uh, as quick as I can. And if we can get to it, I want to get to the fourth one tonight. Or I'm, I'm sorry, to the third one which is, uh, talks about our access, because that's amazing, the access that God has given us uh, in the beloved. So 
Uh, let's go ahead and read Ephesians chapter 1. And if you're at your house, um, you know, and you have some kids hanging around or you've got somebody sitting around with you, you might have them read the text uh, out loud or what have you. But I'm going to just take some time, work through this text, and then we're going to pray. And as I pray, remember that uh, if you're just joining us, uh, if you're a member of HBF, you should have this prayer list in your inbox. And, uh, they will, and you can uh, make sure to go over that. The things highlighted are the things that have been added today. And then we'll remember to those that, uh, like Bobby, I mean, like Dottie Bartlett, who just had surgery, we need to be praying for her as she is up at least some hospital in recovery even now. So uh, let's go ahead and read our text. Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus, to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Just thinking about verse 3 makes you wonder, how's he already done that? If he hath done it, how did that, how did that happen in the past? How's he done it? Well, it's, the answer is in verse 3. It's in Christ. Uh, and so verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him, him is Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him uh, in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by... Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. We'll be focusing on that tonight. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself." that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated, there's that word again, according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom uh, also, after that ye believed, were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I want to pray for Dottie Bartlett tonight. Lord, I want to pray for other members of our church family affected by Monday's storm, uh, people building barns and houses and things that have been afflicted and affected. Lord, I want to pray for those that uh, have spiritual needs in the church body that uh, maybe we can't talk about on open air right now, but or that you know about those. Lord, I want to pray for those physical needs. There's some really difficult situations in some of our ch uh, church members' lives that uh, have nothing to do with this COVID virus, Lord. And I pray for them right now. Lord, you know who they are. And Lord, uh, thank you for giving us prayer and the, the ability to come before your throne. Lord, I pray, God, that you just bring encouragement where encouragement is needed and comfort where comfort is needed. Lord, I pray for uh, Pat Lee right now. He's waiting for people to come by and just connect with the, the Comfort Care Ministry. I pray for him as he's waiting that if uh, there would be somebody come by right now, Lord, that you just encourage them in the Lord. And uh, Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to study your word. We thank you for the ability to lift up prayers to you. And we thank you, Father, for giving us your son, Jesus Christ. I pray a blessing on the reading, the hearing, and the application of your word tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, all right. So we are now in, uh, in verse 5 of Ephesians. I probably should leave my spectacles on as I may need them. Uh, as I, my, my eyes are not as good as they used to be. So we've covered verses 1 through 14, which really, if you just read it in context, really helps us understand that what God is revealing to us through Paul is really the blessings that we get with, with being in Christ. That when we get saved is when, if you just read all the way to verse 14, when we get these things. And so, though God has always had them available in Christ, we, didn't, we were not able to get access. Brian Hedges was not able to get access to these blessings until March 25th, 1987, when I made a decision to trust Christ because I responded to the prompting of the Holy Ghost. It wasn't that I had to be pre-quickened or anything like that. It was the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. And I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about that here in just a moment as well. So, we're under point two if you're just joining us, and we're talking about how God has predestinated us to the adoption of children by Christ to himself. That's what the text says in Ephesians 1 and verse 5. So the word predestin, predestinated or predestinated, predestination, whatever form of that word we want to look at tonight, 
Um, it just follows naturally in line with verse 4, which deals with how God has chosen us in him and the foreknowledge that uh, God has in that. Now, if you have your Bible tonight, uh, and I, I put a lot of the notes on the note page. If you're looking for the note page, you can go to the listen. Look under the, uh, the tonight's sermon under uh, Wednesday Night Live under Ephesus, and you'll find um, the information uh, where that's going to be found. You can also, uh, if you're hitting the live button, uh, the live feed on our website at hbfcast.org, there's a place for you to click and get these notes so you can see the verses that I'm going to. Uh, if you don't have that, you're going to have to listen carefully because I'm going to hit several cross-references that you're going to want to get down if you're going to study this out and really keep it in your pocket for later. But first of all, I want to talk to you about how predestination follow God's foreknowledge in, reg in regard to how we're chosen um, and, and, and how we are found in Christ because we're found in Christ. So predestination... Uh, is not a word that's just limited to the book of Ephesians. It's also found in Romans. So if you have your Bible, you want to turn over to the book of Romans, uh, just a few few books back. Uh, if you got to Acts, you went too far. And then go back another uh, page or two, and you'll be in the book of Romans, chapter 8. And Romans chapter 8 is a, an incredible, uh, well, the whole book of Romans is an, it's an, really the doctrinal thesis for the New Testament. And all of the New Testament really stands on top of Romans uh, especially the Pauline epistles. And so uh, Romans 8, 29 says, for, for he, who he did foreknow, he also did, here's this, another mention of this word, predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So here's another reference. And notice that in uh, Romans 8 and verse 29, uh, I told you last week when we talked about being chosen that God, uh, he foreknew uh, how he was going to bless the people to put the, the uh, reveal, I should say, how he's going to bless uh, mankind with all spiritual blessings. And how is he going to do that? And he's going to do it through his son, Jesus Christ, uh, before the foundation of the world. He already had this planned out. And you can even see it as Adam is working his way, and we're going to talk about that tonight, working his way uh, into, uh, you know, being established in, on the earth and in his seed after him, how God was already laying this plan out early on, even when man and angel missed it. Uh, God had it all laid out. So uh, he foreknew, it says in Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be firstborn among many brethren. So God already knew what Paul was going to reveal in the book of Romans regarding the body of Christ. Uh, being in the bride of Christ is only, uh, is only given to people who are born again. The concept of being born again was not some covenant promise in the Old Testament. It actually has nothing to do with the inheritance of Israel. Israel still will get a physical inheritance in the kingdom of God. But this spiritual inheritance that we have in Christ is something that's unique to the body of Christ, to the bride of Christ. So you can't obtain it by some Old Testament covenant. Uh, we get it through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. God already, in, the, in, the, in his uh, foreknowledge, understood that there would be a, a bride for his son, and that son and that, that bride would be called out. And, of course, he reveals that in the New Testament, and uh, we understand that we are born again, that we're a new creature in Christ Jesus. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. But he also mentions this, this, this thing about being adopted in the book of Romans. Uh, in chapter 9, he mentions it. He also mentions it back in, uh, in Ephesians. I want to go back to Ephesians 1 because adoption is tied with predestination in both Romans and in the book of Ephesians. So let's go back. If you have your Bible, keep a finger in Romans because we're going back there. But uh, keep a, put, a, put your, your eyes back on Ephesians chapter 5. It says, So having predestinated us unto the adoption... Uh, now, by the way, uh, I'm not, I don't want to leave off where I left off last time. Remember, I, I brought up the doctrine of love, which happens to be absent in the doctrine of predestination in regard to Calvinism, but it's actually so important because love is it's impossible. The doctrine of love requires a decision. You cannot love without making a choice. The very, do, the very definition that Jesus gave is, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's a decision someone makes. So God chose uh, you know, to, to make us holy and without blame before him in love. He has established us. He has chosen us through, through this, this uh, avenue, I'll say, of love. When you get to verse 5, he says, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children, notice what it says, by Jesus Christ. The point is those who are uh, predestined to be conformed by Jesus Christ according to his will are conformed into his image. We'll see that in Romans 8, 29, Romans 12, 1 through 2. 
Uh, it's going to be by Jesus Christ. If you're going to be conformed to his image, if you're going to be adopted into his family, it is going to be by Jesus Christ. And then it says, according to the good pleasure of his will. I'm going to leave off the good pleasure of his will until I get to the end of this discussion regarding predestination, but I'm going to take a little time with that as well. And so the adoption of children is explained very clearly. I told you to keep a finger in Romans 8. Go back to Romans 8, and you'll see the adoption of children being discussed uh, very clearly. So uh, if you have your Bible in Romans chapter 8, in verse 14, I'm just going to back up there in verse 13. It says, For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as uh, many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the, notice this, the sons of God. That's who they are. All right, so let's, let's keep go, digging a little deeper. And then he says this in verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of, and here's that word again, adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now it's interesting this subject of adoption comes up. Uh, in the book of Romans chapter 8, because so does the word predestined uh, over in verse 29. For he, for whom he did foreknow, I've already read that, he also predest, uh, he did predestinate, and then he's very clear there, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Okay, and verse 30 goes on to say, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them also, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. And so then it gets into this great uh, uh, discussion of how God has called us his elect. And then in chapters uh, 9, he deals with the elect of God in the Old Testament being the nation of Israel for, through chapters 9 through 11. And what about those guys? Well, if, if, if this is the way in, then what happens to Israel? Then he gives all those answers. So in verses 14 and 15, and what I want to point out in regard to spiritual adoption, if you're doing, following the outline, by the way, uh, point B, uh, the fill in the blank is adoption. The adoption of children is explained very clearly in Romans 8. And then I want you to see under sub point one there, spiritual adoption, spiritual adoption. Are you putting these verses up so they're able to follow along? Okay, so spiritual adoption is, is uh, the next fill in the blank and it precedes physical adoption. That's a really important point because we're going to see really two adoptions that take place in Romans chapter 8. The first one is spiritual adoption, which happens to go really nicely with what we're looking at in Ephesians chapter 1. And there's a reason for that because our physical adoption is not first. It's our spiritual adoption. And so when God, God has chosen us to be uh, in Christ and he has predestinated us to be conformed uh, to his image, we know that from Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, and so we are going to find that to, to, for this process to happen in Christ, uh, he's going to adopt us. Well, you said, well, Brian, I thought we were born again. Well, you were, but you've also adopted some things when you were born again. So I'll, I'll talk to you about that here in just a little detail in just a minute. But before I do that, I want to point out the two adoptions that you find in uh, Romans 8. And so you probably figured out already the spiritual adoption, which I just pointed out is in Romans chapter 8, verse 15. So if, you're mar if you've got a wide margin like mine, I like Oxford, I use an Oxford wide margin. You might want to, oh, I dropped my, dropped my lid there. You don't need that, Brian. So in my wide margin, you might want to put a note. I got a note in the side of my margin that says in verse 15, uh, first adoption is spiritual adoption. Uh, and my note says salvation already uh, confirmed spiritually. And amen, amen to that. And so it's the first mention of adoption, uh, the first the first mention of adoption in uh, in the Bible is Romans eight fifteen, and then you'll find it in, in verse twenty three, which we'll see in just a minute. Romans nine fourteen, and and then several places in Galatians, which I'm not going to get into tonight. So the spiritual adoption that we have here it causes us to cry, Abba, Father. A lot of people like to point out, you know, the the Greek and the 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 English there, uh, or the Hebrew. I'm sorry, and the Greek and the original and all that. But right now, it's not important. What's important is that, that we understand that there's a spiritual adoption, spiritual adoption. So that's in verse 15. Uh, and as we go on down through the book of Ephesians, I'm not, or I mean the book of Romans, I'm not going to read all of it uh, for time's sake, but we'll see that uh, he's talking about being free from bondage and all of those things. Well, spiritually, we've been made free through our, our new birth in Christ. But when you get to verse 22, it says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Uh, we may be free from the, the, the bondage of sin through Christ Jesus our Lord, but you know what? We're still bound by our physical body, and all of creation is still not set free. 
because there's another adoption that needs to happen. In verse 23, it says, And not only they, but we ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Now, when you read verse 23, you'll notice that it says first fruits. And it'll, many of you that are Bible students will think, ah, 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus Christ, first fruits, right, in the resurrection. Uh, well, that's, that's a really, that's perceptive because there's something that happened with the first fruits, and that indeed is a resurrection. And that's a physical adoption. And so it says there that, that there's a, the waiting for the adoption. This is the second adoption. What is that? Well, it's not the redemption of our souls, right? That's already occurred over in verse 14 and 15. When we get saved, we're spiritually adopted. We're as good as in the family of God. We are, our souls are sealed until the day of redemption. But then there's a second adoption, uh, which is a physical, that, that blank underneath spiritual adoption, sub point two under, under B, uh, is physical adoption. Uh, the adoption of our body, right? So God is going to change our body uh, because we know from, again, if you're a kind of a Bible student, you'll study 1 Corinthians 15 and realize that the Bible is very clear. Flesh, this old carcass, and the blood in my body is worthless. It cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Well, what is the kingdom of God? Well, it's a spiritual kingdom. And that's why we have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Because, because of Christ, I've been spiritually adopted, but yet I'm not limited. Just because flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God does not mean I don't have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Number one, I have a spiritual inheritance, but there's also a promise of a second aspect, I'll say, of our, my adoption in Christ, which is not just the spiritual blessings, but physically someday I will be changed, the Bible says in Ephesians, or 1 Corinthians 15. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain will be caught up together in the air. So I'm kind of blending 1 Corinthians 15 with, with uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But uh, that's, that's what the Bible teaches, is that we get a physical inheritance. Boy, that's something to look to, forward to. So every saint, everyone who's born again, and remember the introduction of Ephesians is written to the saints and the faithful in Christ Jesus. It's not written to lost people. It's not, a, it's not talking about how to be saved. It's talking about what happens when you get saved. Well, you are chosen in him. You are predestined to be conformed to his image. We know from Romans chapter 8, but that means that we have been adopted, which was also found in Romans chapter 8, through this adoption process. So I'm going to talk to you just a little bit more about this adoption process. So when you were born again, you were issued a birth certificate, at least if you're born in the United States. Uh, not every country does that. And, uh, but uh, in the United States, you get a birth certificate. And, uh, and, and so that's a really important document, right? Because you can't get, there's a lot of doors that close if you don't have a birth certificate. They don't even uh, necessarily know you're a citizen. So uh, when you're born again, you were issued a birth certificate. So in Ephesians 4.30, if you want to write this down, uh, and uh, it's on the screen, just look at what this text, this text says. In the same book, by the way, of Ephesians, later on Paul goes to say, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. Okay, what's the day of redemption? Well, what he's talking about is that second adoption, right? When he comes and takes back that purchased possession, which happens to be you. You've been bought with a price. That's why we're to glorify God in our body and our spirit, which are God's, right? Notice he mentions the body and the spirit because we got a spiritual adoption. We got a physical adoption. He says, hey, so before Jesus comes for your body, that second adoption, that first aspect of adoption, would you not grieve the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption? You're, you, are, you are sealed. Now, uh, let me just kind of give you a, an illustration or an example of what that looks like, which I put a spot in the notes. You, you're, I'm going to have a few references here. So if you're under sub point three, they're dealing with the example uh, of this. Uh, you'll be ready to, to take a few notes. So um, my, my children, of course, many know that my children, uh, Samuel and Elizabeth, they're, they're not our physical children. Uh, they both bear the physical characteristics of their biological parents, just like everybody that's born. And ultimately, if you take that back far enough to our great, 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 and just keep going to your great, great grandpa somewhere down the line, you will all, all of us will hit Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and then we'll all go back to Adam. I mean, there's no doubt about it. That's how the human line works out. You know, Genesis 9, 
Genesis 6, and then Genesis, uh, you're in chapter 1, 2, and 3, and we're all found in Adam. So uh, ultimately, we all have that characteristic, but just uh, just bring it up to more uh, current biology. My children both bear the resemblance, of course, physically of their biological parents. So they, uh, they, um, uh, so, uh, so while it's true that, the, that biologically that, that we, me, me and Amy, are not their biological parents, it's not true legally, not at all. Now, legally, uh, I am their parent. I mean, every way uh, there is around it. Why? Because I got a birth certificate. I got a birth certificate that says so. So when you adopt a child, you go through a process. It's called consummation. And uh, obviously we think about consummation. It's usually in the context of giving birth. Interestingly enough, the legal aspect of adoption also has, at least in American culture, um, it has a, it's called consummation. And so what that means is that you have a child, a, an adopted child, uh, in your possession. Maybe it's through the foster care system or some other avenue and uh, whatever the case may be. Even if it's a family member and you've been given guardianship, it's not the same as adoption. Once you go to court and, and it's time to adopt that child officially and formally, they're going to say, we are going to consummate, meaning that we're going to make this relationship legal and binding. And so you get an attorney and you go before the judge. And all the legal documents are met. Uh, all the fees are paid, hopefully. And, uh, and then, boom, you are now legally, this child is yours. So then you get a birth certificate. And on that birth certificate, uh, like if my son or my daughter's birth certificate says... Uh, it doesn't say, you know, John Doe, baby, whatever. It says, uh, in my son's case, Samuel James Hedges, and in my daughter's case, Elizabeth Grace Hedges. Born such and such day, such and such state, and so on and so forth. That is their legal birth certificate. Because they are, that, and that certificate, of course, is sealed uh, by the judge. That's what makes it legal and binding. And so uh, the same holds true for the saint. And so when we are born again in Adam's sinful image and likeness, I might add, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the distinctions in the New Testament and the Old Testament between the likeness and image. So strap your, uh, you know, be ready, buckle up and uh, get ready for that as well. Uh, because in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, chapter 5 and verse 3, uh, and uh, you're going to see that verse on the screen, uh, you might want to write this down. So this is an interesting verse. It's, it's, there's a lot in Genesis that is... You just read over it and you think, oh, yeah, that's just Genesis. <laughs> there is so much in Genesis if you have a King James Bible. If you don't have a King James Bible, you're probably going to lose a lot of this uh, because the Bible, King James Bible is a word-for-word -word translation. And so Genesis 5.3, it says, And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his... And notice it says, own, own likeness after his image. So uh, the, the Holy Ghost is careful to say, okay... Seth is in both the likeness and the image of Adam. And he called his name Seth, of course, is what the text says. So, so this is the, how that correlates to us. Um, when you go back, for instance, and this wasn't in my notes, another, another note that you can go back in the genealogy of, um, of uh, Jesus Christ in the book of Luke. Uh, it's interesting because when, when you come down to the end of it uh, in Luke chapter Three, it says, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam. And then it says, which was the son of God. So Adam started off as the son, the son of God. Um, and so, uh, but something happened in the garden. And of course, many of you know, he died spiritually in the garden. He didn't die physically until almost that day he died. So the literal 24 hour period, he spiritually died Spiritually died. Get this down. He died spiritually first. Instantly, when he took of the fruit. When he took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Spiritually, he was dead. He was separated. That's why he ran from God. But he didn't. Genesis 2.17 says, The day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. But why didn't he die physically? Why didn't he drop dead? Well, because uh, he did. And, and at the end of his life, ended before a thousand year period. So God, again, is using this. Day is with the Lord a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. Someday soon, Jesus is going to return at the second coming. And then he's going to set up his rule. He's called the last Adam. He died on the cross and took care of our sin in a day. He died on the cross within three hours. It was finished. Boom. It was done. Our sin was, was immediately reversed. The curse was reversed spiritually. But we won't see the culmination of his earthly reign and rule 
for a thousand years until almost 2,000 years later before he rules and reigns on this earth for a thousand years. I bring that up because it's always spiritual and then it's physical. Same thing in Romans chapter 8. You have a spiritual adoption, then you have a physical adoption. The church has lived for 2,000 years spiritually being quickened, being filled, the bride of Christ, being, uh, being brought together. What God foreknew, he already knew that was going to happen, and he's been bringing that in. But he's quickening her first, and then he will bring us all together in a beautiful body. It'll be outstanding. So I, think you're, I hope you're tracking with me. So keep, keep, keep meditating on this issue of image and likeness, because we are all in Adam's likeness and image when born, regardless of who your birth parents are. Let me say that again in case you didn't pick that up. So we're all in Adam's likeness and image when we're born, regardless of who your birth parents are. Ron, why is that? I got to have someone live in the house. That's right. Good answer. Is that right, Samuel? Samuel says that's right. Okay. So... Because Ron says, but not just Ron, the Bible actually tells us that, uh, that we're all born in Adam. So in Genesis 1, when God is creating man, and uh, you'll see this up on the screen, Genesis 1, 27, uh, this is what God said. I didn't say this, this is what God said. So God created man. Now, who is this man? This man is Adam. In his own image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So uh, both male and female are in his image. And by the way, this is not talking about physical anatomy. It's talking about, because there's a distinction, but both uh, the male and the female, Adam and Eve, were in his image. And so, okay, okay, Brian, what's that got to do with the price of tea in China? Well, I'll get there in a minute. So after the fall of Adam, God pronounces a curse. Um, and, uh, and he does that uh, for capital punishment. The, the, the reason for this is, Every murder since Genesis chapter 4 and verse 9 is simply a reenacting of the offense of destroying the first Adam's son. And there is no death penalty for capital crimes until the flood of Noah. Isn't that crazy? So I'm jumping ahead with you here, but Adam has a son. His name is Seth. We've already seen his, uh, that comes after his other son named uh, Abel. So his first son is called Seth. His second son is called, uh, I mean, his first son is called Abel. His second son is Seth. Uh, and then, of course, there's also Cain. So if you want to throw him in, there's three boys, my three sons. I think there was a show about that or something. But anyway, that's a different meaning. So in Genesis 9-6, uh, after the flood of Noah, God all of a sudden brings in this new consequence for murder called uh, capital punishment. They didn't call it that. He just said it this way. He describes it. Genesis 9-6, Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed for the image of God... Made he man. Okay, wait a minute. So there's no death penalty, right? And I'm, uh, maybe you don't know about this, but if you go back and study, the first murder outside of Adam being murdered spiritually by, uh, uh, you know, Satan in the garden, the first physical murder, right? By the way, the spiritual murder came first, just like a spiritual birth comes first. The physical murder comes after that in, the, in regard to Cain slaying Abel. All right, so Cain slays Abel. What happens to Cain? Well, he gets the electric chair. No, he doesn't get the electric chair. As a matter of fact, there is no penalty. Well, there was a penalty. Let me back up. But there was no death penalty at that time. Uh, so he literally takes his own brother's life, and God says, hey, the, what are you doing, Cain? Your brother's blood is crying from the, the earth. Uh, you can't get away with this. And so Cain's like, oh, my, my curse is greater than I can bear. And, of course, you know the story. And uh, he gets banished from the, the garden. And uh, he gets marked and uh, has to live a, the rest of his life, and he goes and builds cities. So that's what Cain does. There's no indication, though. There's no, uh, there's no uh, meeting out of justice immediately for Cain. Uh, and so when we get to Genesis 9-6, after quite a turbulent time uh, up to Genesis chapter 6 with humanity, uh, God lays out this law, and he says, hey, listen, uh, and this law is still on the books today. Uh, Whoever sheddeth man's blood by man shall be his blood be shed. And then he says this, he tacks onto it, for in the image of God made he man. Now, that's an interesting thing because God intended man to be above that. This, he, man has no authority to take a man's life, uh, except now uh, in, the, in the case of, of murder, capital punishment, 
Um, and then, of course, that evolves further down the road as we get to Romans 13 and so on and so forth. But man had no authority to take man's life because he had nothing to do with creating man's life. Cain had no business executing that kind of judgment on, uh, on Abel because that was, not, that was God's creation. That was, that's God, I mean, that was a complete blasphemy to, to murder his brother. Uh, and so the, the, uh, the sanctity of life is in essence, it's a God value. And then, of course, it's a Christian value because it is God, not Satan, who values human life. Just think about that for just a moment. It is God, not Satan, who actually values human life. It's such a contradiction in our culture, you know, when you think about it. Um, you know, today, uh, you know, we stop heaven and earth over a pandemic, which I'm not saying we shouldn't, I'm just saying. Whatever you think about that, great. But at the end of the day, uh, they're still lobbying for abortion. I mean, does that make any sense? Of course not. It's a conflict because man is corrupt, right? And so uh, we're, it doesn't make any sense. If it were not for the love of God, man would be doomed without help of, 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 of any help at all. And Satan would destroy us completely. It wasn't for God's benevolence toward us. God is love. And don't forget it. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, right? It's in his foreknowledge. God loved the world, it says in Romans or John chapter 3 and verse 16. He loved the world, not just the chosen. He, he loves everybody. He doesn't want to see anybody murdered. He didn't want to see Abel get slain. And he's also the one who's able to fix that problem. But uh, I tell you what, it's an amazing thing to think about what would happen without the love of God. And that's why we need a new image and a new likeness. We need a new image and a new likeness. Uh, we really do. Because we're in Adam's sinful image and likeness. Just like Seth was in Adam's image and likeness. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 3. Now when we go back and we look at you say, yeah, but what about, it? isn't that a contradiction in the Bible? Because when we look at Luke, it says that Adam was a son of God, and he's made in the image and likeness of God. Well, he was made in the image and likeness of God, but something happened when he fell in the garden. First, spiritually, he died, and it, and it happened immediately. Second, physically, he died at 930 years old, uh, Genesis 5 says. He died physically. He did not make it a literal day, 24-hour day, and he didn't make it a thousand-year millennial day either. He died. But Jesus Christ, who died on the cross in three hours, he atoned for our sin so that we can be made alive. When you get saved, how long does it take you to get saved? In an instant. Boom. Just like at the catching away of the church. When you get adopted spiritually, it's in an instant. The promise is to the church that's left at the resurrection. When we get resurrected, we will be changed in an instant, just like that. And, of course, we rule and reign with Christ. And, of course, he also rules the day. He'll rule for a thousand years on this earth. I just love the Bible, how all that goes together. So, so when we preach the gospel, and I'm going somewhere, so I hope you're hanging with me here. So when we preach the gospel of God, it sounds like bad news. Well, and it sounds bad because God's only begotten son died on the cross for our sin. I mean, that's it's kind of like, ooh, that's kind of rough. I mean, man. Uh, and he, you know what, though? He was innocent like Abel. Um, the son of perdition devised a plan to murder Jesus Christ. Uh, but he miscalculated because Jesus was not able. Uh, he was God, and he came to atone for the sin of the world. We're going to talk about redemption in one of our points coming up. And, and so he came to atone for the sin of the world, and in so doing, he was able to restore the image of Adam's fallen race. And how does that occur? Well, by faith. It occurs by faith. It is certainly a spiritual birth, but it is also a legal transaction that takes the soul of Adam's fallen seed and rightfully and legally grafts it into Christ. So March 25th, I, that's when I got my birth certificate, 1987, spiritually speaking. So I was born in Adam's image and his likeness, but something happened to me spiritually March 25th. And at that day, I can remember when it happened, my soul was, boom, sealed. I legally was adopted spiritually, my soul is now the Lord Jesus Christ, the day that I, I asked Christ into my heart. And so the image of God, well, it is Christ. This isn't figurative language. We believe every word of the Bible, it's, and we take it literally until we cannot. And, and, and uh, he bears God's human likeness. So we find in Christ both the likeness and image of God. And notice, I remember, I remember what I told you in Genesis. God was careful to say in his likeness and his 
image regarding Seth. Seth something happened when Seth, um, when Seth was born and he bore the likeness and image of his father who was that of a fallen sinner. But when we get saved, we take on the image and eventually the likeness image is spiritual the likeness is physical of our lord and savior jesus christ which looks just like his father it's amazing how that works and so we are legally adopted at our spiritual birth right and then our soul is sealed until we saw in romans 8 the day of redemption and our physical adoption so second corinthians 4 says this in verse 4 in whom the god of this world hath blinded the minds of them this is speaking of satan he's the god of this world Uh, in whom the God of this world, small g, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the, the, the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now, wait a minute. Just If you're a Calvinist, I just got to say this. Hardcore sovereignty of God, you can't be quickened unless the Spirit quickens you before you actually get quickened and all that. Listen, what do you do with 2 Corinthians 4? You can very well see there's a battle going on for the light of Christ. It literally says, In whom God of this world hath blinded the minds of them who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in them. There is a battle to keep people blinded from the light because there's a real battle going on to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There has to be, there's, it, it's, it's amazing. You, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta admit that. There is a battle to keep people blinded. If it wasn't, if it wasn't a battle, it wouldn't be mentioned in 2 Corinthians 4. Paul wasn't just preaching to the, you know, atmosphere. Uh, he was preaching because he had an, a, an enemy that was actively working to keep people blinded. And he was actively working uh, for Jesus Christ to illuminate them uh, through the gospel. The actual preaching of the word of God is what illuminates people. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. There, it, when you get that down, all of a sudden, uh, it takes nothing away from God's sovereignty. It takes nothing away from God's providence. It takes nothing away from God's foreknowledge because everyone who will be saved in this dispensation, which we'll get to that in a few words in Ephesians 1 as well, is going to get saved through the preaching of the gospel by faith when they actually have their eyes opened and understand the gospel and believe it and receive it by faith and are born again or quickened and find their inheritance in Christ. Okay, so... So spiritually, our image is changed the moment we're saved. We, are, we adopt the image of Christ. You say, well, Brian, why do you say that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27, it says so. It says, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. <clears throat> okay? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. When you get saved, what is the seal of the... Of your, of your salvation. It is the Spirit of God, Ephesians 4 says, seals your soul until the day of redemption. But what does that really mean? It's Christ in you. Literally, Christ is in me, sealing my soul. And, and, uh, and uh, the Bible, Colossians talks about being spiritually circumcised. I'm cut away spiritually from my flesh. It's an operation of God made without hands, the Bible says. And my soul is set apart until the day of redemption when my body gets changed because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This sounds like some, you're watching a Marvel movie, but this is, this is way ahead of the Marvel. This is what happens when you become a New Testament Bible-believing Christian. So then at the resurrection, the adoption process is complete. We receive the image of Christ at salvation, Jesus Christ, who is the express image of God. Uh, when, and then at the resurrection, our body is changed in that second aspect of the adoption. Remember I said the spiritual comes first and the physical comes second. And when you deal with predestination, it's both dealing with both your spiritual and physical because both our physical and our spiritual, starting with the spiritual and our physical redemption are found and our resurrection in the, in, the, in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all in Christ, which is the whole point. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, in Christ. Man, he is our inheritance. And so let's look at the next point. So uh, you don't have a next point yet. I'm, I'm just still going on this. I want you to think about 1 John chapter 1, or I'm sorry, chapter 3. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. As, uh, as John is speaking, he says, Beloved, which is definitely a term for the church, but when we're in Ephesians chapter 1, we're not talking about the church. When we get to Beloved, I'll get to that. I was going to get that today, but I'm going to get to that next week. So you'll have to hang on for that. But he says in 1 John chapter 3, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Wait a minute. How, we're the, now are we the sons? How is that possible? 
I don't look like Jesus. I look like Brian Hedges. I look like my earthly father. I look like Adam. Well, that's what I look like on the outside, but on the inside, I look like Jesus Christ because I'm already in his spiritual image. I just don't look like him yet. I will get his likeness when I'm resurrected. And so will you if you're born again. But First John is very careful to say, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, when are we going to be changed in an instant? When we see him at his coming. When he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope near him, no, in him, everyone that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Why? Because we've been spiritually adopted. We have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And when you got saved, Christ was in you. Your soul is sealed until the day of redemption. You're just waiting until you see him physically and he changes your vile body into that of a body like his and you get a new body. That's what the resurrection of the saints all about, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. All right. He's like, Brian, I knew that. I'm like, I'm glad you know. So, so I want you to think about this word as well. That it, when you look in 1 John 3, Look down there at the end of verse 2. He says, when, we sh when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Well, I thought it said in verse, uh, verse 2 that we are, uh, that right now we are the sons of God. Well, we are right now the sons of God. But I won't look like him until he appears. Now, notice that word like. I like, be like him. When you think of the word like, what do you think of? Well, you think, you should think of the word likeness. Right? I, was tell, I was telling you, Adam, Seth was born in Adam's image right, and his likeness. When we get saved, God reverses that. I'm born again in God's image. Christ is the express image of God. When I got saved, the image of God entered me, Jesus Christ. And then once I get resurrected, I will have his likeness. I will look like him. So that'll be cool. And you will, you will as well. So that's cool. So let me finish with one thought so what's really cool for me is so both my children uh, right now profess to be saved so if that is true at the rapture of the church as we are conformed into uh, the, both the likeness and the image of christ of course the image at, at, at salvation and the likeness at the resurrection uh, then you know what my kids will look just like jesus and so will i we'll look like our father in heaven so all of a sudden this spiritual adoption we're going to be looking all alike again. Which isn't that the goal of every parent that's born again? Now, Ephesians isn't written to lost people. It's, it's a great, there's some great verses to use to lead people to Christ in there, obviously, in chapter 2. But it's written to saints to help us learn about our inheritance. When you, get, when you have physical children, the Barneses have two little, fresh little, cute little twin babies right now in the NICU. And uh, they're getting out, hopefully, this week, and they'll be able to go home. They're going to raise those sweet little babies. But those sweet little babies, they're going to look like them, and they're going to... They're going to cue like them, and they're going to do, make messes like mom and dad. It's all just going to be there, right? And they're going to raise these kids. But the reality is, is, is those parents, any good Christian parent, they know like they know that there's only one thing that's most important in any Christian parent's life, and that is to make sure we do not leave our children in our likeness and image, in our endemic likeness and image, right? We want them to be born again. It doesn't matter if they're your adopted children, your, your, your birth children. It doesn't really matter. As a matter of fact, they can be your birth children. And if you do nothing to lead them to Christ, you will leave them in Adam's fallen image and likeness, and they will die and bust hell wide open. How's that for parenting? It's not very good. Now, I understand if you're lost, you don't know any different. But if you're saved, for goodness sake, that's got to be one of the highest calls that you have as a family, as a husband, as a wife. Man, that's what you've got to be focused on is making sure your kids come to know Jesus Christ, because if not, they're going to be left in Adam's sinful likeness and image. And don't kid yourself. Go back to what I was saying regarding um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. There's a battle in your home to keep your kids blinded from the simplicity that is in Christ. And you know what God wants to do? Confound it with works. He wants everyone to think, the devil wants everyone to think that you can work your way into God's righteousness. And that's the biggest lie ever perpetrated on mankind. And so... Uh, when we see the word like, uh, take that into account. Now, let me keep talking to you a little bit about predestination. I'm going a little long here on this, so I'm going to try to wrap this up. Is there, it is therefore no accident that after the discussion of adoption, 
we see the word predestinated show up in regard to the inheritance at the end of Romans 8. Now, I told you we're in Romans 8. We're still there. I'm going to look down here in verse 29 in the fun, the, the really the awesome part of this chapter. We get all these great promises. It says, let's back it up to verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. There's, the, again, the doctrine of love. A lot of people say, oh, well, all things work together for good. No, it doesn't. All things work together for good to them that love God. And again, Jesus defines that in, Rome, in John chapter 14, verse 15, and John 15 and verse 14. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's a decision. It's a choice, right? If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love God, everything's going to work out for good uh, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be, uh-oh, conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Okay, we already touched on that, but now that we've said all of this, let me say that. That is really, when we talk about predestinated in verse one of, uh, or in chapter uh, one and verse five of Ephesians or over in Romans chapter eight, we're talking about being conformed to his image. God has predestined that we be conformed, that we be changed, that we become like him. And somehow that's missed on so many levels in today's culture. Notice it says, conform to the image of his son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, he also called. Whom he called, he also justified, just as if I'd never sinned. And those he justified, he also glorified. Man, that's part of those great and precious promises that we have in Christ, in Christ. Once you get in Christ, that's all yours. So then Paul goes on to tie this in with what it means to be elect in Romans 8.33. I knew you were waiting on that because it goes on to say, uh, what shall we then, verse 31, say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, uh, how shall he uh, not with him also freely give us, here it comes, all things? Well, that's what we're talking about in Ephesians. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places, where are they all things going to be found? In Christ. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, uh, who is even at the right hand of God, who maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword... As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And it goes on to talk about that nothing is going to be able to separate us from the predestination of God and the foreknowledge of God. No, that doesn't say that. Nothing is going to separate us from the love of God, the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We were chosen in him, and praise God for that. So... In Romans 8.33, we see then that Paul goes on in chapters 9 through 11 to reveal what happens to the promises of God to Israel. Uh, Romans 9 through 11 is not, is not a thesis on our election, but on the nation of Israel's election because God has made promises to them as well. And he will also resurrect them and restore them as we've already seen. They're already physically born right now, but they're not spiritually alive. They need to be quickened and that will happen in the coming tribulation. And they'll be redeemed physically and uh, reestablished in the millennium. So our election is found in Christ who was chosen to redeem us before the foundation of the world. And God foreknew that. So you got to make sure you get that squared away. So what about, and this is the last thing I'm going to stop. What about unconditional election? Uh, in the end of verse uh, 5, as I mentioned, I would get to. So go back to Ephesians because this gets tossed about quite a bit. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5, it says... Uh, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And that good pleasure of his will gets thrown about quite a bit. The last few words of Ephesians uh, 1 and verse 5, according to the good pleasure of his will. The Calvinist philosophy reads um, in, a, in a concept uh, called total depravity. It reads that into the text. Uh, and that's again, that's that philosophy I was talking about. Obviously, we believe that every man is... is uh, is found in Adam, and that all men are, sin are sinners, Romans 3.23, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Uh, but in Romans 10.3, it also says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. So the Calvinist would say, ah, there you go. See, 
They're, they're totally depraved. They can't seek after God. I would agree with you. No man seeketh after God. But Jesus Christ, the Bible says, came to seek and save that which is lost, right? So that's why he sent the spirit of his son. So before I was even saved, I was being convicted in my conscience. I wasn't saved. I didn't have the spirit of God in me. I wasn't saved. But you know what? He was teaching me through the preaching of the word of God, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. And the lights were starting to come on as the Holy Spirit of God taught me before I was even saved because I received a measure of faith and he gave me more. And more until the fact that I was able to hear the gospel, believe the gospel, and then I received the gospel by grace through faith are we saved. But uh, Romans 3 is very, uh, very interesting. So you see there, Brian, there's no one that seeketh God, so no man, uh, you know, can be saved then, I guess, right? Oh, well, wait, be, then God has to sovereignly quicken them, but then they still got to be lost so that, that they can later on make an, I mean, it just gets convoluted uh, because they were found in Christ before the foundation of the world and God's foreknowledge. Uh, or he, they were not foreknowledge, foreordained, I should say. They were foreordained. It gets really messed up, and it's not the God of the Bible. And so, uh, and so that's why we preach the gospel, because men really are not seeking after God, but their conscience gets pricked when they see the light. They're blinded from the light of the gospel. God wants them saved. So if we love God and keep his commandments, that's why he commands us to preach the gospel. It doesn't say that men cannot choose to make a decision. Uh, that's absurd. Adam was able to choose before and after the fall. You ever thought about that? Yeah, he was. He was able to choose. Um, yep, he was. Um, I think about Cain. You know what God said? Hey, don't do this or sin lieth at the door. Well, that's a decision. He made a choice. He chose death instead of life. Uh, you think about Abraham. Abraham chose to offer Isaac. He gets rewarded because that was by faith. Lot chose to go to Sodom. That was a decision he made. Adam, Abraham said, hey, where, where do you want to go? Okay, there you go. You can get it. Jacob chose Rachel. He did not choose Leah. He got Leah, but he chose Rachel. He made a decision. Jesus chose 12, by the way. He's, okay, he's Jesus. But jo Joshua, what did Joshua say? Choose you this day whom you will serve. Right? People have to make choices. They have to make decisions. Joshua asked the children of Israel to choose who they would serve. Now, the reality, I like what Alan Shelby says about sovereignty. He says that, uh, I, I'm paraphrasing it, but something to the effect that God is so sovereign, and he is, that he, can let you, he will let you have your free will and still come out with the right decision. And that's absolutely true because God is that big. So what's going on at the end of Ephesians uh, chapter 1 and verse 5? I'm glad you asked. Um, the first, first thing, this is not talking about salvation at all. It's talking about being conformed to the image of Christ. We've already established that. Second, uh, this is a discussion not of salvation but inheritance. Remember, that's what we're talking about in Ephesians 1. This is what we get because we're in Christ. It's, it's the, his will, as we started off a couple of weeks ago talking about that. This is God's will and testament. Man, when we get saved, he has all these blessings and spiritual places in Christ. This is a discussion, not of salvation, but inheritance. Remember the will and the testament. It's opened and, and, and it's typically the inherit and the inheritance is distributed to the heir, which is a child uh, of the benevolent benefactor. Right? Not always. But the child of God, whom this epistle is written to, finds in it the will of God. And it pleases God to see us conform to his image. And it pleases God someday to come and catch us away because Jesus Christ is the express image of God and we will also be in his likeness. That is the pleasure of his will. So when I read the end of verse 5, what I, I don't see what, uh, what you know, a five-pointer sees. What I see is it, is it pleases God to see us conformed into his image. It pleased God to put us in his image, those that would call upon his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So simply, if you have not had your mind corrupted from the simplicity of Christ, uh, man, you can see this very clearly. Uh, clearly, clearly. And uh, I tell you what, God tonight wants you to be saved. If you're not saved, at the end of the day, that's what this is all about. You need to be born again so you can get in on this inheritance that God has for you. So I've gone way too long. I'm going to be finished there. If you're online today, did we get anyone online? Am I just... Everyone's online. Oh, well, whatever that means. The whole world, six, six billion people. All right, so, uh, so we're glad. I, would, I really should have been more prepared for that. Uh, so I think most of the folks probably online right now are home folks. If you, don't, if you do have a question about salvation, feel free to call us, 380-3033. 
and we'll be happy to talk about that. I'd love to tell you more. This was kind of a heavy study. This is more for the HBF church family. So if you're an HBF member, I hope this was a blessing for you. And uh, if you're just looking in on what we're doing, I pray this is a blessing for you. Come to this church. We're going to start opening the doors May 10th uh, for our services at 9 a.m. and uh, 1030. Uh, we have enough room for about 30 families. We have overflow, uh, all of it at safe distance, both in this room and in the overflow. Uh, and so we'd love to have you here if you are healthy and you uh, are not compromised with an immune system and you are, uh, your conscience is clear about uh, coming to church. If not, then uh, it's, it's a great uh, thing to stay home. We have members of our church body who literally have, uh, you know, they have immune system deficiencies. Some of them have uh, an immune weakness of some sort. So we certainly don't want to allow or see anybody, uh, you know, succumb to COVID right now because once they do get it, it is a nasty virus. Uh, having said that, we're taking our first step of three. God willing, we'll be open full bore you know, by the end of summer, that's my goal. I don't know what the goal of the society is, but that's what I'm looking at because we got a big Bible conference coming up in September. We need to be ready for it. We also want to try to do a VBS if possible at the end of the summer. Uh, and we also want to try to get in some things for the high school camp and do some summer activities, Lord willing. Those are all uh, tentative uh, based on what we uh, have coming up. But uh, certainly wash your hands, keep yourself healthy, healthy, but also wash our mind in the word of God. You know what? We talk about catching viruses because our hands aren't sanitized and our bodies, you know, whatever, we're not in the right places and we're taking in the wrong things. That's what happens spiritually too. Make sure you're being washed and renewed in the water of the word. Uh, clean your mind daily. Be cleaned up in the word of God so that you don't get any spiritual viruses and get blinded from the simplicity that's in Christ and miss the, the fullness of your inheritance. And if you are, you're grieving the Holy Ghost, man. Don't do that. You've been sealed at the day of redemption, not to grieve the Holy Spirit, but to take advantage of all these spiritual blessings that God has until the day of redemption and the completion of that consummation that happened the day that you got saved. So that's going to be awesome when we get raptured out of here. So are there any questions, Ray, before we sign off? All right, any, nobody has anything to say. I, I will tell everybody, I love you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, remember to pray for the Barneses. Remember to pray for Dottie. Remember to pray for and help those that, out in the body that uh, don't have power and need things. Uh, I, hope, I hope everybody's got the power back on. I know Leela went over 24 hours without power, so uh, that storm was nasty on Monday, so I pray everybody's uh, recovering from that. Thank you for joining us tonight. If you don't have power, you're probably not joining us tonight, so we're also praying for you. So let's have a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. I pray a blessing on the reading and the hearing of your word. Thank you for your people uh, that are so faithful to just tune in and, and, uh, and just uh, study your word. And Lord, uh, thank you for just giving us a time to just meditate on, uh, Lord, what we've been predestined to receive in Christ. Uh, every uh, passage there, it's a lot of in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, because, Lord, everything that we are and, and everything that we have is found in Christ, both spiritually and physically. So we're so thankful for those great and precious promises to us. And, Lord, we're so thankful that it pleased you uh, to find us in Christ. Thank you for, in your foreknowledge, setting Christ aside to fill up the fullness of the Gentiles. Uh, Lord, we thank you and we uh, praise you and we uh, ask a blessing now on this time and this teaching and the rest of our week. In Jesus' name, amen.